Good morning, everybody. Uh, you are so welcome today on this call. Happy that you joined this webinar with this very important uh, topic. So I'm Andre Kilian. I know some of you and uh, some of you I don't. Uh, and the fact that we are here say that it's important for us to think about the way that we're living and working in this new, uh, in this new way. And um, I'm privileged to, to work with people in different contexts thinking with people about uh, the way that we live and the way that we work and the way that we have integrated lives, uh, manage, managing ourselves, uh, connected to our purpose. And I'm fascinated to think about soulful ways of living, but also soulful organizations. And I hope that this is part of the, that uh, conversation. Over the past 15 months, we were forced to work in a total different way and we didn't have lots of time to prepare for this and the question on the table uh, this morning is how do we find a sort of a hybrid way of working uh, where we can embrace this new type of work but also still have people that's engaged people that's productive people that's healthy and people that's connected uh, connected to and, and feel they belong uh, to an organizational culture. I'll say something about belonging later. I want to acknowledge that uh, the fact that we're having this conversation is a big privilege because it means that we can think about our work. It means, probably means that we have work. And uh, we, we're having this conversation while there's testing times out there. And uh, these times, you know, just, just as an example and as an acknowledgement, came very close to this webinar. Actually, the first person who, who registered for this webinar is an HR manager, and he's been uh, on oxygen and, you know, for the past three weeks on a ventilator. And I'm saying that acknowledging it today because some of his colleagues are here. That's the times we are in. But the testing times also brought innovation and creativity. And I'm thinking with John O'Donoghue, a Celtic writer who uh, writes very philosophically about work, but he says that work should be a place of possibility and expression. And although it's maybe a pie in the sky, I also hope that this new way of working created creative uh, ways for us to make work a place of uh, possibility and expression, a soulful place. Some of the benefits that I've seen, so I'll share a few ideas with you as an introduction, not something I read about, but just what I've experienced with people in general. I'm working with people individually uh, in all different contexts and in, in organizations. And some of the benefits I've seen over the last 15 months is that it really uh, sort of unlocked people's creativity. We had to make a plan. They say you're the best entrepreneur when your life depends on it. And it definitely created also flexibility. Uh, people have flexible ways of, had more flexible ways to, to work. And that gave people a lot of freedom. I also think our sense of time changed because for one, we're not necessarily traveling hours and hours to work anymore. We have more time that we can either use for ourselves, or our families, but also we've seen that people use this time to work more. But our sense of time definitely changed and the time waste, I think people are very aware of that. But for me, the biggest benefit is just glimpses of humanity that I saw return, human ways. Um, I did a talk three years ago about rediscovering humanity in the workplace and Little did I know that this year will actually force us to almost rediscover that. I mean, I, I speak to a leader that I've known well on Zoom in a coaching discussion. He's always very professional. It's always eight to five. You know, he's, he's sorted. And while, while we're having this, this conversation, his five-year-old boy is climbing all over him. And we had a lot. Beautiful. Uh, I'm sure most of us have seen interesting stuff in the background happening um, while people have Zoom meetings. I, I also uh, think about 
you know, a lady that I had a discussion with uh, in, a, in a coaching discussion, I met her on Zoom, I haven't met her before. And after a while, I realized that there where she's sitting, working from home, it's a little one bedroom flat. Her partner is sitting next to her. He's also working and they have a little 18 month year old baby and they're working shifts. Humanity returning. So I've seen more and more human ways. I've seen people in meetings with their cats on their lap. I'm sure you've seen it as well. What was the personal impact on people? I've experienced that it impacted people in a way where we had to think differently about our energy, uh, the way that we manage our energy. It definitely impacted focus, our ability or inability to focus. I think we, we had to rely more on people to, to manage themselves, to look after themselves, to care for themselves, to have their own systems. It definitely had a personal impact on family. Yes, some of us were at home more, uh, which is a great benefit to our families, but also sometimes we're there, but we're not there because we constantly switched on because we are, somebody said, we are living at work now. And then on an emotional level, obviously the uncertainty and the doubt hasn't had an emotional effect on people. But I think the biggest theme for me in terms of personal impact is the theme around boundaries. And I can go on for hours on uh, about that. Our sense of boundary, our sense of, engaging in something and stopping and disengaging before we engage to the next thing. We, we, in a sense, lost that because we are in the same space working and living. You just keep going. You jump from meeting to meeting. I mean, the meetings are scheduled till 12 and the next meeting start at 12 again. So our ability to have habits and rhythms to stop and disengage, which I call boundaries, is really, really challenged. And that's something we need to think about uh, properly in the next few years. It in influenced uh, what we expect of each other. People, leaders that tell me that now the people expect them to reply or they expect it of themselves to reply at nine in the evening. A good example of this is a CEO that I spoke to. And he told me that the previous evening, his daughter came to, to call him for, for dinner in his home office quarter to seven, he was still on a Zoom call, he finished the call, and then uh, went to the dinner table, he said 10 minutes into dinner, he realized, I'm not here, I'm here, but I'm not here, and he said for a split second, he really, really, really missed uh, his 15 minute drive from work back to the house. I think those are the bridges that the different spaces give, gave us that you can drive and you disconnect and you connect again. We don't have that. We have to think about that. Other examples of people that created uh, these boundaries for themselves uh, had a discussion with uh, a lady in, in uh, working at a tech business, and she sits in, sit at her, at her living in her living room working, and we decided that she's going to buy a whiteboard. And uh, she's going to, when she starts in the morning, she's going to take off the painting in their living room, put the whiteboard on, five o'clock, take the whiteboard off, put the painting back on. And that was just a little boundary for her. And the kids knew if the whiteboard's on, mommy's working. One guy that in the morning did, you know, shower, shave, breakfast, dress, and then he got into his car, drove around the block and drove back in and started to work. I think the second influence is on organizational culture. Um, that we really need to think about. And there's people here that have lots of experience today in building organizational culture. Ken Wilber, uh, who developed the integral theory uh, that think about systems and then integral organizations, said that, that culture consists of three things, mindset and belief, uh, structure and procedure, and behavior of key leaders. And that's a big pointer because we can't see each other behave anymore. And that has a massive effect on uh, organizational culture. If we think about onboarding, when somebody, a, a new person join an organization, they can't see people behaving. And that had have a massive effect on organizational culture. The fact that we, that we don't see each other behaving day to day. Also in terms of conflict and communication, the fact that we don't see each other's behavior in this culture makes it more difficult when there's differences. Just yesterday, a leadership team told me that 
the fact that they don't see their people makes makes it so difficult to pick up on stuff because we haven't bumped into them at the water cooler and had a quick offline discussion or uh, got up and, and walked to something. Less behavior, less context. I think that'll have a massive effect. And that's something that I'm quite passionate about to think, how do we recreate this to create space? One of the things that emerged, some of the things that emerged for me is suddenly organizations and teams want to have this team check-ins, uh, either the whole organization or, or in, in smaller groups where we meet once a quarter, once every two months for an hour on Zoom and just do a little exercise, just to, to be human, just to listen, just to connect. And that wasn't there two years ago. If I speak to leaders, uh, fascinating, they're on 24 seven. Um, they really look, need to look after themselves. But if I think back last year, the first three months, um, the first three months, people said, or leaders said, bring it on. We shouldn't change this at all. Uh, we just want this to, to continue. This is the way I'm going to work. The next three months, they said, we're so tired, we engaged all the time. Um, and the next three months, they said, bring the people back to the office. We need to get back to the office. That is the challenge. I think if I summarize, uh, the challenges for me going forward is how to build spaces of trust. I think we'll need more and more trust with this new way of working. Secondly, I think the way that people manage themselves, there's a bigger onus on people to, to look after themselves, manage themselves, structure themselves to be productive and to keep going, but also to have these boundaries. I think thirdly, motivation. I'm reading a book, uh, Brave New Work at the moment from Aaron Dignan, and he says that organizational motivation, motivation at work consists of meaning, purpose, and belonging. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice challenge to think about how do we create belonging for people in this new way of working. There's an article written in 2017 by Tim Dimoff, High Tech and High Touch, uh, how to balance tech and people. And little did he know what will happen in 2020. Um, and he's asking the question, how do we embrace the new technology without using the human element? Also, Hari Rai, who uh, wrote the book 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, is saying that um, intelligence, artificial intelligence, I mean, that's, that'll, that'll develop and, and technology can play a big part in that. But we have to, with that, develop people's consciousness because consciousness is about sensing and emotions. And we need to, to, to do that together. And that's almost, you almost motivated me to sort of keep going, to think about human consciousness, soulful ways. With all of this said, I'm so happy to, uh, to have four panel members here, people that I really trust, uh, people, all, of, all four that I know well, and they represent at least four angles, if we think about work. They represent the, the theme of management, managing. Uh, secondly, organizational development. Thirdly, leadership. And then fourthly, uh, technology. And I really want to thank the four of you, uh, Peter, McEllery, Renell, and Vickers. Um, really thank you for giving your time today, free of charge, for us to just start this conversation and think about something that's really important to us. The, for the four panel members, you are welcome to switch on your cameras. Um, I want to introduce you uh, together, uh, one by one, but, but together. Uh, Peter Fora is the group CEO of Mergon Group. And um, Peter's specific uh experience that he brings today is to to lead uh obviously a group but also uh multiple businesses uh, on the one hand uh, in mergon peter run a finance team or manage a finance team uh, uh investment team sorry that need to make big decisions about where they invest 
and how they're going to use these investments. But with that, he's also building an organization with um, multiple teams and also multiple businesses inside. And I think Peter's experience of, you know, marrying all of this is that they, they think about business and investment, but they're doing it for the right reasons because they're also running a foundation. And uh, I, I think if we, if we think about soulful organizations, the, the balance between profit and purpose is something that they really, like you, you're getting it more right than wrong, Peter. Um, so what I really appreciate about Peter is that with, this organization that's growing and the fact that he has to sit on many chairs, he kept his sensitivity to people and being very, very much people-centered. Then uh, Renel Retief, uh, Dr. Renel Retief, should I say, is the registrar of uh, Stellamos University. And Renel brings a specific experience today on managing on a very high level in a sort of a multi-organization, an organization with different very important stakeholders. And I think for, for today's discussion, uh, Renel bring experience in making very high level decisions in high level meetings that has immediate influence on people and immediate influence on different levels. And I know that there's a lot of pressure to make uh, decisions that has uh, consequences and impact. And I mean, just imagine you have 30,000 customers, and that's just the students plus. Uh, what I really appreciate about Renel uh, is that she has this can-do attitude. It's almost like igniting people to be motivated. Always, let's do this, let's try this. Always with people focus and people in mind. Then, uh, McEllery Hoffman, Dr. McEllery Hoffman, he's the CEO of uh, Prilexis, which is a machine learning company in Stellenbosch. And uh, he's built the, the company from the start, eight and a half years ago, they started. And uh, McEllery brings a very specific expertise in technology, tech development. But more than that, I think the ability to think about tech and all these new things that I don't understand a lot about, but doing it in an ethical way to think where is it working for us and where not, and building an organization that's a new type of organization, a flat structure. Um, and in my view, this, the, the Prolexis, uh, this is definitely one of the soulful organizations that, again, uh, have the balance between purpose and profit and they do business for the right reasons. What I, what I really uh, appreciate about McEllery is his uh, humility. I mean, right until today, they never speak about, you're not allowed to speak about leadership or leadership teams in Prolexis. Um, the immense humility. Thank you for being here, McGarry. And then Vikas Gwalpa, um, Vikas and, and myself, we've been known each other for years and years, uh, working together uh, on different projects. And um, Vikas brings specific experience today in organizational development, thinking about the way that we support employees to be productive, but also roles and responsibilities. Um, on individual leadership level, but also on team level. And, and what I really appreciate about Vikas is uh, the fact that he's a straight shooter. He will not uh, tell a team or a leader what the leader wants to hear, but he will tell somebody what they need to hear. And I always appreciated that about Vikas. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to ask the first question to Peter. Um, Peter, uh, I want to know, you know, obviously with this topic in mind, how did this new way of working uh, impact your leadership position, specifically because you're leading uh, multiple teams and multiple businesses in a group? Maybe you can talk us through just some of the experiences, but also gains and losses uh, that you saw over the past 15 months. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Andre. Hello, everybody. Um, hi to everyone that I know. It's nice to see some familiar names and um, uh, on the um, on the call. Um, thank you, Andre, for for putting this conversation together. I think it's um, so critical that we create these sort of structured moments where we can talk about stuff where we which we are all going through. Um, 
maybe just um, to um, before I dive into giving a few thoughts on my own experience as leader, um, just to give you a little bit of background of what we experienced and went through at Mergon. Um, uh, at so as you said at Mergon, we actually have multiple teams working across the completely different disciplines. Um, but working together to build a single organization um, and primarily driven by a, a desire for to have impact. And, um, and in our organization, we always had an in-office culture. I mean, people would travel and come back, but the office was sort of home base and it was a fully work from office um, type of culture. And then um, as we all experienced, lockdown came and just rocked our worlds and um, completely shifted the way that we had to operate overnight, um, which was quite a dramatic um, sort of shift. And um, I don't think we're going, we're not going back to that. So it's probably not worth dwelling too much on that. Um, maybe just to make two comments. The, the one is um, <clears throat> that we got a lot of feedback during that time. Um, uh, well, we were quite intentional to say, guys, this is, Work is important, but this is also a time to be with families and um, to be careful not to create an expectation of for people to almost double their output because they're now sitting at home, but actually to say that, listen, we trust you. You're going to deliver on, on the commitments that you need to deliver, but you also need to make time to just experience this as a, as a season where there's a little bit more space for you to to be close to your family. Um, uh, the second thing um, that was quite um, interesting for me uh, from the, what we did was we said we're going to have a daily meeting at 8.30. We uh, structured it as a sort of a, a short prayer meeting as a team, but really it's a, it was a daily team meeting. And a lot of people said it, it was so helpful to have this daily meeting almost as a way of starting the day together. Even though we were all on our own, we were, we were collectively starting our day together. Um, so as we came out of lockdown, we realized that um, uh, as leaders, we had to recognize that the, the culture has shifted. People's expectations have shifted. People sort of came back and said, listen, we've proven that we can be trusted and uh, to work from, from home. And that even some of the functions that we thought weren't really work from home functions, like accounting and so on, that everyone was quite happy, uh, 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 quite happy to work from home, and that they actually delivered. And and so there was sort of an expectation that listen, this is the culture shifted, and we need to move with the times. And so we really scratched our heads as a leadership team. How do we how do we navigate and, and where do we take our team into this um, this next season? And um, and where we ended up was at a, a place of what I would say is structured hybrid um, a structured hybrid environment. So as opposed to maybe a fluid or a completely flexible hybrid environment. So our thinking was as follows: we wanted people to be trusted and treated as responsible individuals who um, can take responsibility for themselves and continue to deliver the outputs that we expect from them. Um, we also wanted people to um, belong in their teams and for teams to form strong bonds. So we want to make sure that we get people together in, in their specific teams and to, to come to the office, to spend time together as a team, to build those relationships. But the third thing, and you mentioned belonging, Andre, is what we felt was really important is that people don't just feel they belong to their teams, they actually belong to the bigger organization or have a sense of belonging in the bigger organization. And so we wanted to cultivate all three of those elements um, because if people just think of their teams, then they stop thinking about the greater good of the organization. And if they just think about individuals, we start losing that relational team dynamic. And, um, and so with that in mind, we designed this um, or adopted the structured hybrid approach where on Mondays and Fridays, we would have the entire organization in the office. So Monday mornings starting together starting the day together um, uh, with a meeting and spending 
uh, time in the office, getting the vibe going for the week. And Fridays, we would usually have a lunch together and um, sort of ending the day um, or ending the week together as, a, as an organization. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, each team could select two of the days where they could work from home. Um, and, um, and, and in that way, sort of everyone overlaps during a week. Um, and what we found is even that is an adjustment. Um, you know, what we found was people sort of missed the rhythms and, and struggled to really get into the rhythm of saying, Chris, today you're at the office, now tomorrow you have to be at home. Um, and so it's taking time for the, for people to really slot into and, and understand their own rhythms around work. Um, what we found was Mondays and Fridays that were great for culture and relationship building days. But actually, people were being very social. And, um, and there were people who really wanted to work, but others are saying, hey, this is my sort of relationship building day. This is the day where we can collaborate, where we can have those uh, water cooler discussions. And so it was great having the vibe. But then we had other people saying, I'm really struggling to work and it's impacting my, um, my productivity. Um, and then on the other side, uh, the, the Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday, uh, Thursday would be great for deep work. Um, so it has a role. It creates that space for deep work. But then some people would fill those days with Zoom calls and um, some people would struggle because their home is just not ideally designed for, for working from home. And so it's, a, it's actually um, as much as this creating the flexibility is supposed to create space for people, in many um, people, I think it created actually more tension that people... And it's almost draining because you constantly have to think about how you're positioning, you're uh, uh, managing your time, how you're making sure that you're productive. And so um, from that sense, I guess, um, as, a, as, a, as a background, for me as leader, as a leader of our organization, um, what I'm finding is that there's definitely um, a role for, for me as a leader and for my leadership team to help our teams think carefully about um, not just their place. Of, it's easy to shift the places of work in one sense, but to shift how we work and understand how we plan our week to deliver certain tasks and, and uh, dive into certain things during certain times in order to be the most productive and accomplish and have a sense of, of fulfillment from, from the stuff that you're doing, that you... You, you think about what are the things you want to do at home this week versus what are the things you want to do in the office. Um, a second thing that, um, that I've realized, and, and I think that's been a challenge for everyone, is um, how do we facilitate collaboration? Um, you know, collaboration happens more easily where teams are very much in, needed to work together, whereas I guess in our organization, it's the collaboration is is a you you can do it you can do your work without collaboration but it's so much richer when you collaborate and so to make sure you create those moments for collaboration and uh, and that often happens out of relationship that we we sort of find ways how to build relationship across the teams and not all get stuck into our teams and as i said create a sense of belonging only within your team um a third thing that we've specifically invested in, Andre, as you know, is in resilience. Um, we're finding that even in this work from uh, in this hybrid work sort of environment, which is supposedly going to create um, more space and flexibility for people, um, we're actually finding that it's draining people in, um, in ways that they don't expect because you have to think about how you do your work, how you use your time, how you create the different environments on different days. And we're also finding it's more fast-paced. I, I often say to people the way email um, accelerated our world from faxes and um, normal mail, that's the way Zoom has accelerated our world um, as opposed to where we were before. And so... Um, people's resilience um, comes under under strain because there's there's real uh, it's just relentless the pace um, that many people are experiencing and so 
we've created these smaller res resilience communities in our organization where we've got five, six people journeying together from different teams just to connect at a human level and just talk to each other and um, have that facilitated um, by Andre um, to create meaningful moments for people to connect, not just in their own teams, but across different teams. So yeah, Andre, that's some of my, my perspectives of some of the things that I've experienced as a leader, some of the things that I've looked to address and, and with what some of the challenges um, are um, of this journey. At a, at a, as a, the CEO of the organization, the biggest thing for me is just how do I make sure that I pick up the heartbeat of the organization, that I don't end up just speaking to leaders, but I actually create an opportunity to connect with individuals on a meaningful way that's working in the organization so that that I can really understand where people are at. And if you're working remote, you sort of end up um, uh, gravitating to the leaders. Um, uh, and so that's probably been a challenge for me is to make sure that I keep those connections to the broader organization. I'm gonna leave it there. I think my time is up. Thank you so much, Peter. It's a pity that we, we have to look at time. Um, so I'd, I'd love to, to comment on a lot of things. I'm not going to do that today. Thank you so much for that for that angle. Um, Runel, I want to go to you for the second uh, question. Um, and and you know, obviously, virtual work. The the my question is, how did virtual work or work from home impact uh, the dynamics of meetings as well as decision making? Uh, in the context of management, and maybe you can you can talk us through experiences that you that you've had benefits and risks, uh, specifically meeting dynamics and decision making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre, and good morning, everybody. Um, I loved listening to the our previous speaker. I've already learned a lot. Um, so maybe just before I dive in, to also share a little bit about um, our institutional culture and the way we. We make decisions um, in the university. So we are we are in excess of 3,000 staff members. And then with our students um, being around 32,000. And then, of course, uh, the extended stakeholders beyond them, their parents, and a lot of people affected by our um, decision making. Um, we, are, uh, we have a very uh, structured way of making decisions. Uh, it's quite a democratic uh, uh, setup in the sense that the CEO hardly ever takes executive decisions. Um, we govern through meetings, which is not always the most agile way of, of getting to a decision. It takes quite a long time. It's very hierarchical in the sense that we have various committees um, feeding into our two main governance structures. The one is the Senate. And the Senate is a, a body consisting of, uh, of about 300 um, professors. They, uh, they uh, represent the highest decision-making structure in the university. And you can just imagine um, uh, 300 uh, highly intelligent people with the, all their um, own views and to get consensus in a meeting like that, to make decisions uh, require uh, quite a bit of um, skill and thinking around that. And then also our council, which is similar to what you would have, what you would call your board of directors in a, in a private company. So, yeah, so, so with COVID, um, the challenge, of course, was for us to, to get to decisions much quicker. Um, and uh, we, we uh, brought structures um, into place that, uh, similar to a contingency committee, and we actually had to officially also get our council to give them and um, the authority to take certain decisions very quickly. Um, so, yes, and then, of course, we have a very strict regulatory framework, which also um, prevents us from doing, you know, whatever the times dictate that we still have to be compliant. And um, I listened uh, to Peter and thought um, when he said this is a time, they decided this is a time to, to also spend some time with the family as long as you deliver on your normal outcomes. For us, delivering on our normal outcomes actually required much more than um, what we would normally, um, much more input. So just to maintain our teaching and learning and research 
um, outputs really required much more input. So um, I can definitely relate and everything, everybody um, within the institution, the majority, and I see, I saw Johan Kuris here, um, he's, a, he's on the academic side and he participates in some of these structures. Um, that, that the input required was such that I do think um, uh, it, it was, uh, we uh, had a lot of strain and, and burnout in the system, um, just trying to maintain that basic delivery of our teaching and learning input. So in terms of meetings and decision making, um, what uh, Andre asked me about, um, it was interesting when we, when we went into lockdown level five, um, we, and our, we had our first uh, council meeting or board meeting, how cautious everybody was, and we were overly prepared. And we we um, we asked our council members and our board members to to um, work through the agenda, and they had to um, they had to send through their questions beforehand so that we we could have a very streamlined meeting, and which resulted in an extremely efficient meeting. I think our first meeting in lockdown level five was about two hours long, whereas we would normally have the whole day of discussions. But um, as it happens, the pendulum then swung to the other side and people said that they missed the engagement and this is not the way to have a board meeting and there should be much more conversation. Um, so we then sort of had to find a middle ground to just get people to participate and to voice and to, and to participate in a much more normal way. So to, so to not over prepare in the way that we did. Then came our first Senate meeting where we had 300 participants. And um, we soon discovered the chat function being a very disruptive function in a meeting. So instead of people raising their hands and speaking as they would in a face-to-face -face meeting, we had a lot of side conversations happening in the chat. And it was a tough task for the chair to discern what was what was matters that you would need to pick up on? What is just chatting? It's almost like people having a conversation during a meeting, a side conversation. At the end, we also had to think of ways to limit that and to say, right, in a Senate meeting, we try to copy or emulate what you would have in a face-to-face -face meeting, where people put up their hands and they speak um, to get that that right, and to have less of a of a disruptive meeting environment. So that's just in for that's just a little bit about the sort of the procedural um, elements. But then, of course, um, uh, in terms of decision making, uh, it's very. I found it uh, that we were much more reliant and became much more reliant on formal ways of making decisions. Um, in the online environment, much more ballot, formal voting ballots um, that could be audited. Um, it, it was much less of a consensus seeking environment, especially in larger groups. Um, you didn't have the, you don't have the benefit of people's body language um, and really sensing the atmosphere in a room. So in many cases, um, and, and uh, we had to prepare for meetings. And, and my division, um, I fulfill the role of the sort of the company secretary also. So my division would typically also render secretarial services to our decision-making structures. We would have almost five people supporting a single meeting, especially if it's one of the, the governance structures where, where um, high-level decisions are taken, where they would prepare, uh, we would do scenario planning and prepare the ballots. And if it's uh, internal stakeholders, that would be easier. But at the moment we had, um, say, an election, which um, which was for our alumni, which is, of course, almost 300,000 people. We had to, to um, uh, be able to identify them. And, and their technology really played its part. So um, we really were became very reliant on technology um, to, to make decisions that could be audited and that one could stand by and that could stand in, um, in a court case, for instance, those things happen. So the, the pressure to have proper governance in an online environment um, was, I think, much more, um, and we experienced much more strain in that regard. So for, uh, for me, the interesting part though of meetings and decision-making is about the dynamics in the meeting. So on the plus, on the pro side, I do think we spoke about the increased efficiency, 
Uh, we could fit in much more meetings um, than we would normally be able to do. You would switch from one meeting to another. As Andre said, um, with our breaks, we could, when if Ramaphosa opened his mouth on a Sunday, we could literally, within a half an hour on a Sunday evening, convene our contingency committee um, to make a decision that would be applicable from the Monday onwards. And we've had to do that. So, um, so we, we literally, we literally, you know, it was a WhatsApp and the entire committee would be online and we would take the decision that could be communicated at half past 12 midnight um, to our student body to say what would happen the next day. Um, interestingly, um, there is an expectation. There was an, there's an expectation from our student body for certainty. So there's no, it's not a matter of, um, of us saying this can wait until the Monday. We, our students um, would start WhatsApping and emailing you the moment that family meeting um, was over to say, well, how's this going to work now? So rapid change in the environment that really caused us um, having to make uh, quick decisions. And we could do that. We could do that in your pajamas at midnight if you had to, and we did. So, and we do still. So yes, those are the pluses. The other thing that uh, I think um, Andre mentioned, um, living at work, but uh, as, as one of the sort of dynamics that played out in households, I think for me, it was also interesting that, or, or to see how your family members actually for the first time saw what your job was about and what happened in, these, in your life, in your work life. And so, so that was also, I think, a benefit that there was much more, um, much more uh, uh, people and your family members took cognizance of the stuff that you actually do at work. Oh, okay, so this is what you keep yourself busy with. On the downside, though, the boundaries was mentioned, no boundaries whatsoever, meetings carrying on late at night, over weekends, often, um, I think uh, we would say we didn't have a choice, but then also do, is it is it true? Is it in fact the case that we didn't have a choice and could it have been left for the next day? Um, then what I've also found interesting in meetings was these side conversations, um, keeping people engaged. If there's a contentious issue, people would actually start WhatsApping, WhatsApping each other on the side. So trust really becomes an issue. And um, especially if it's a contentious matter and strong opinions, instead of voicing it in the meeting and picking up on the body language and seeing that there's somebody frowning and this, these two people don't seem happy, I think there's a lot of stuff that goes underground and a lot of side shows happening during a meeting. So in the private chat, on a WhatsApp, and it's difficult then, I think, to draw those conversations out into the meeting to, to, to get that transparency that you would typically have in a face-to-face -face meeting to a larger extent. So navigating the politics, I think, becomes an, uh, difficult. Um, interesting alliances that are formed because of this sort of this... Um, uh, um, in parallel meetings, if you if you wish, um, um, so so it's I think it's a, a chess challenge to really draw those conversations into the meeting, um, and then so so I've really thought of how to counter this, how to keep uh, our our participants in meetings engaged. We use our cameras to see if that you're actually uh, in the room and that you're participating. Um, we, would, we would try to facilitate our meetings by creating interaction, so to really call on people to participate, um, to also make uh, the bad habits transparent. I wouldn't do it in all settings, but if it's my own staff, which we are, we are close, I would say, why are you so quiet? Um, I know you might be doing your urgent emails. Just give me 10 minutes of your time. We all know people sit and do emails in their meetings, and that's really not efficient and productive. So to call it, you, as I say, I wouldn't do it in all settings, but if there's enough trust, you can actually speak to that, to that habit. Um, I've seen people use voting polls, so not formal voting, um, but, but just to, to ask people in the middle of a meeting where are they at and to do a quick poll, um, especially if it's a huge, huge forum uh, where you want to ascertain where people are at. Um, and there are wonderful tools that, that I've seen um, working. And then maybe a last thing before I stop, um, when we had... Um, uh, when we had lesser uh, lockdown levels, level three, level two, we, we also ventured into hybrid meetings, which um, 
I think has its own challenges uh, because now you have people in the room and you have people online and often the people online feel excluded. Uh, the people in the room forget about them. So it takes a lot of extra effort to get that participation right and the balance right between uh, the people who is phys physically present um, and the people who are online. So yes, um, I, I really would be interested to, um, to also hear from the participants later on how they navigate these spaces and how they keep the uh, people engaged, especially in your longer, um, longer meetings. Thank you for the opportunity, Andre. Thank you so much, Renel. Uh, again, I, I would love to go on and on and comment on everything you've said. I'm not going to do that now. It's so great to, to have different uh, contexts and different experiences speaking. Uh, McEllery, I want to get to you. Um, a simple question, I think, with a difficult answer. Uh, what the role, what do you think the role of technology is uh, in this hybrid workspace? Uh, maybe you can you can talk us through uh, your, just your own experiences, uh, but also benefits and risks that that you've seen the role of technology uh, in this new hybrid workspace. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for the invitation to speak, and also good morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, so, I mean, maybe I should also make a comment, even though we are. Uh, um, a technology company or, or work within technology does not mean that that we have all the answers when it comes to technology and how to use it within this new hybrid world. So I guess it's for all of us a new thing to, to figure out. But I also want to argue that, that without technology, uh, this hybrid workspace, or you can call it a, a remote workspace if, if you prefer that one, would not have been possible. So in a sense, this whole technology is providing the operating system of, of, of this hybrid workspace. Um, the risk is, however, is if you think of technology that way, is that you just start implementing technology for the sake of technology. And, and, and that can in itself also be a dangerous thing. So then you end up with all these apps and things sitting there and, and, and they also just make you fatigued and, and, and not servicing at all. So to answer in the sense the question of what the role of technology is, I thought that maybe I should look at what are the typical tasks that you want to accomplish with this technology. And I'm going to go through a couple of them and then share some experiences in between. I'm not claiming it's a, an exhaustive list, but at least it, it, it partitioned the world since otherwise we think of technology as only as Zoom or Teams. And, and, and that's just, just a part of this whole uh, ecosystem. So th the first task you would typically want to do is, is, is some form of project management. And interesting enough, that is the room of where collaboration should take place. Um, the risk is in that I've seen many times that people use email to do that, and that is just inherently causing chaos. It can quickly become a nightmare if, if, if tasks and things uh, flow around. So the idea is if you have a central system that, that keeps track of all the tasks, that makes life easier. Now, examples that I can think of is Asana, Basecamp, Trello, and ClickUp. I, I don't get any money from these companies. I just I just mentioned some names you want to Google, if you want to Google. Then the other important one is, is file co collaboration. I mean, it goes without saying that if you work with um, documents and files, you have to somehow find a way to, 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 to collaborate with one another. Google Docs, for example, works very well. Google Apps to 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 in collaboration, prepare a document, but I mean, Microsoft, there's similar technologies. And then of course, for file sharing, so things like Dropbox and OneDrive. Then of course, the other one, it's kind of obvious that it should be there, but, but you will be surprised. So it's time management. And I don't have to say a lot about that. I mean, any calendar will work, but then the question is also how you structure these calendars. And if everyone, uh, what has happened in the in the especially in the hard lockdown is, is that you end up filling your calendar with so many meetings. Since everyone can see you have an hour, you're a half an hour there. You don't have driving time or any of those things, and you end up getting uh, Zoom fatigue or or Teams fatigue with, with all these meetings. Uh, when it comes to the other tasks, is is ideation or, or or problem solving, and and and. 
apart from creating a proper structure for these kind of meetings, and since, since they're not just a normal meeting, you, you can't just expect throwing people in one room and say brainstorm and solve a problem and then think that could just magically happen. So you, you, there are ways to structure it. I'm not going to the detail around that. But um, then some tools can help you. So we use, for example, just a Google Doc that we open and interactively can type in it. But then there are specialized tools like Lucidchart and Blue Sky. You have to think about uh, winning, celebrating wins in your organization. How do you create a culture where you still share wins across uh, in this hybrid world? Applications come to mind, kudos to work or uh, human. Um, Tracking productivity, if that is needed to do, you have to, to think about that. And also people using a, um, tools that can block distractions. That's another uh, set of technology you can use. And then, of course, uh, um, signing documents, if, if, you, if you need to do that. And I mean, um, there are things like DocuSign and HelloSign can, can work very well. What I do want to focus on is, is, is communication, since that's, I guess, what we all use. Then. And then it's important to realize that one can... Uh, um, divide communication in two types of communication. There's asynchronous and synchronous communication. And in this hybrid world, one should try to do more of the communications asynchronous and then uh, only when necessary do it synchronous. And I think we fall, all fall in the trap that you, you end up uh, doing everything synchronous and then it's worse than, than doing um, uh, uh, meetings in, in, in person. So. Asynchronous, of course, is things like email. Um, other examples would be Trello, ClickUp, and then, interesting enough, then there's Slack or, or Teams chat that, that you can use. And this is important that, that, that as a company, you should set your expectation of, of let's call it the, the service level agreement, the answering time for, for things like Slack or team messages. Since Slack can also be a synchronous form of communication or Teams. So if you're saying that it's fine that, that, that you can answer in half an hour or an hour or whenever I have time, then you should start creating uh, um, that uh, um, uh, set of expectation. Asynchronous skills, to use it well, requires that people can actually write well. If you're not able to, to, to explain what you want to say well in writing form, then typically these things work. So then people resort to, 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 to things like WhatsApp notes uh, or WhatsApp voice notes. And to be honest, that's one of the things I hate. If I get them, uh, my uh, answering time is probably a week since, since, since it's just irritating to listen to all those things. The other thing with writing, however, is, is that the intent is not always clear. And sometimes people mean something well, but then actually as they write that, uh, um, it, it comes over not that clear. Then synchronous communication, the other form is then, of course, Slack, uh, Slack calls, Teams, Zoom, and, and, and those kind of things. We should not forget a telephone. That's also a form of synchronous communication. I've discovered that, that in the heart lobby, sometimes that's the best form of communication. You don't schedule a meeting, you pick up the phone, you call someone and have a quick call or have a quick conference call. Um, since that, that creates kind of this, this, this environment of quickly run into a person, uh, into a person at the office. Um, as I think Renel mentioned earlier now, and this is uh, as well, so distractions are typically an issue in these kind of uh, conversations. And then a, a point of contention is, of course, video. Should it be on or off? And I'm of the opinion it should be on. Uh, um, I recently read a, a paper that in the case of a brainstorm, you should uh, the video should be on and everyone should be unmuted as well. And then, then that creates more kind of environment where we really want to be together. So in my opinion, I think most friction in this hybrid world is then also around communication. As I said that I think most communication should be asynchronous. And then the trap is that before within this uh, um, too many meetings, too many other things, and we actually just want to meet with everyone. And then, as I said, we don't write enough, well enough, and so when you have the Zoom calls, it, it takes really effort to get everyone on the same page. Um, Runel also mentioned that, but in this hybrid world, of course, there's this two worlds that's being created. So the fear of, of missing out, in a sense. So you have a conversation going on in the real space, and then it's also people in the, in, the, in the virtual space and it is just a challenge um, that they can feel that they're not very well connected in that space. Nowadays, you, 
you find some better camera solutions that's not always out there that actually makes it easier to to to, to see people uh, within the bigger rooms. And so, I mean, I, I, many of you have probably attended some meetings where you have a, a meeting room full of people, you sit on the outside, and then everyone has this tiny person that you can't see, so you can't judge what's, what, what's going on. Um, other challenges is, of course, um, the difficulty to go to whiteboards. I mean, I've mentioned applications to, to, that, that can assist with it. And this is, I think, where the place where a hybrid workspace work very well, since... Uh, um, you can actually then just meet in person. I mean, I want to mention other practicalities like load shedding, of, uh, uh, so technology things, and so not everyone is back at power at home. Offices typically have backup power, so how do you deal with it? And then also just common things like even putting a light behind your camera. It is important towards the end, I want to say that, that um, you can also use existing technology to implement ideas that you already have. We've had this uh, lunch lottery at Prolegas where we randomly assign people in, in, in lottery with a lottery style to have a physical lunch together. And when the hard lockdown came, we make it virtual. So people physically would, would, would still have meetings over Zoom, but then what they will do is, is they will actually eat in front of their camera and at the same time have this conversation going on in a smaller group to, 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 to kind of just be human uh, in that process. So in summary, um, I think when it comes to technology, as with all types of technological implementations, you should ask the question, what is this supposed to do? And not just think of Teams and Zoom. And then the other important question is, can you use existing technology to implement the solution? I mean, I give the, the, the virtual lottery as an example. And then it is important to lay down the rules for virtual communication. What do you expect? And, and not expect. And then the most important thing is, is, is be open to experiment and be open to fail and be open to, to make changes so that you can move to a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, McEllery, for that. I think we'll, we'll talk about technology and the benefits and risks for a long, long time. You can't do without it, uh, but we have sometimes to do stuff without it. Uh, because I last, but definitely not the least, um, from the, the perspective of, of organizational development, I'm just wondering in your uh, journeys with clients, uh, meeting different teams and different people, uh, how you've experienced the, the impact of remote work uh, on employees and, and what maybe we are learning from an organizational development uh, perspective? Thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Um, it's fantastic to listen to the other speakers and to just understand the varied experience of people. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll briefly look you know, sort of in sort of three focus areas, just to think about the initial impact and response of COVID on work environments and how I saw clients respond. Um, think a bit about and talk a bit about what I'm currently seeing sort of 14 months later, um, how companies responded and what the impact is. And then lastly, just think about, you know, how organizations can facilitate continuous performance because um, from my perspective, we really need to think about how, you know, productivity and performance of people in, in companies. So initially um, when COVID happened and lockdown happened, it was amazing to see how positive many companies sort of responded on it. Um, it. I don't think it was seen as a crisis. I think people sort of thought, you know, how just how do we respond to this? And it was a positive thing. Many of my clients, you know, moved quite quickly to set up uh, employees to be able to work from home. And this varied, you know, just from assisting people to have good computers at home, access to the internet, um, and even also a change in, in work hours, which happened quite quickly for many clients. And I think that helped a lot, just adapted some work hours to create some flexibility um, to link with sort of personal rhythms. Um, some of my clients who are in agriculture uh, didn't experience lockdown um, um, as such because they were allowed to, to keep on working. So they had to make an effort in terms of social distancing protocols and making sure that people are safe. And they did that. And in a sense, for them, it was business as usual. 
Um, in describing that, I think my awareness was that initially there was positivity in terms of responding to the challenges, but also a varied experience of what in one industry sort of were required to the next was very different. Um, but I think it was overall quite in, um, positive. In this sort of phase, what was interesting for me is to see how varied uh, sort of the need for people is for support in terms of doing their work. So for some people, it was really great to just work from home initially, um, sort of had that freedom and where they didn't have to sort of fall in with typical office rhythms and structure and protocols. And for them, that is a, what is a great space to be creative and to, to carry on with their work, sort of feeling less interrupted by typical office rhythms. Um, for other people in that first phase, it was quite a strong experience of the guardrails or the structures or the rhythms of the office just fell away. And for the first time, they very often for some of them, they, they had to sort of be very accountable for their own rhythms and their own disciplines um, working from home. And for some of those people, it was sort of an experience of working in the dark, um, not sure how to be. Um, when they're not at the office and it was sort of a learning process or a learning phase for them. So I think that was uh, the initial phase. Um, but as I say, for many of my clients, very positive um, and people were very creative in how they responded. And I think I saw also companies in, in terms of management being very supportive to be understanding of how people experience this, what they're going through. Um, 14 months later, it's a bit different. Um, I, I mean, Andre, you also mentioned it, you know, so companies responded in the first three months and then the next three months, people said, you know, okay, so this is working, but then they said, okay, people need to go back to office and sort of a mix of that. Um, what I'm seeing now is the impact of COVID and different working models lies at a very personal individual energy sort of level. Um, and also individual health. And that's my experience. It's, it's, it in, it's become very varied in where people are now at. Because um, on a daily basis, I hear from people who say, I've got this need to connect with my colleagues like the old days. <laughs> or I want, I've got this need to be with my colleagues. Um, so that's the one part. But also we deal with people and we hear with people talking about the experience of loss, of trauma brought about by COVID, either their own illness or that of people close to them, um, and people living with grief um, more than in, in, in the past. And I think that impacts on people's ability to be productive when they are working or when they are at work. And I think that's a big part of what we are dealing with now. Um, the positive side of that is to see that there are still amazing amount of people who flourish in these uncertain environments. So they are able to respond quite creatively. Um, and also we see how people have sort of adapted in their own way to working remotely. So I've got people that I know, they moved to the countryside. They now live an hour and a half away from the office and they go into the office once every second week for two days. And for the rest, they live in the countryside and they love where they're living. And they found their new room and they're actually doing well and they've got high energy levels. Um, we know about people who accepted new work or new jobs um, in um, countries overseas. So they're earning foreign currency, but they're still living in South Africa in their sort of home where they were. So their situation has changed quite a bit in terms of work or employment, but they we're actually doing really well. So obviously those people are really valuable in your organization because they bring a lot of positivity and sort of high levels of energy. Um, on the other uh, sort of extreme are those people who lost their jobs. So we have a huge amount of people and even clients of mine who downscaled because they had to, they terminated employment. And we have people who are at home and they're looking for work willing to accept any entry-level job just to earn some form of income. And you can imagine the impact of that. And also, you know, colleagues who've lost colleagues because, and they know their colleagues have lost their jobs and they deal with that and that takes energy. In the middle, I think that for organizations, it's an important part to focus on 
are the employees who are still at their original employment. They're still working. Um, they haven't lost their jobs. Um, they've got this hybrid model working at, at the office, working remotely, working from anywhere. But those employees are sort of in a space where they're still working, but they're working in this, this context of very long uncertainty um, and this constant change. And you work with a, with a workforce that actually, in a sense, has been traumatized and they're dealing with feelings of loss, but they also deal with the challenge of performing. So there's pressure to perform, there's expectation to perform. But they, they, in a sense, have lost guardrails or even access to leadership. And I think companies do well when they focus on this group of people to say, how do we make sure that this group of people who, in a sense, not so much has changed, but the context of work has changed, they there. How do we help them to be engaged? How do we help them manage their own ener energy levels on a daily basis? I mean, I think that's that's where opportunity lies, but also the, the challenge lies. Um, so w when we think about what companies can do now, I think it's, in short, I want to say, take one step closer. Um, so leaders um, will do well to find ways to get closer to employees. Um, and I'm saying it's sort of this very guarded because I know for most CEOs, most MDs, they've had an extremely tough time in the past 14 months. Probably some of them will tell you I've had the worst time of my life in my career because I have to manage myself, my own health, my own mental health, but also my business and the risk to the business. But the principle of high empathy um, and really understanding where your employees are at and how they are doing I think that becomes important. Peter alluded to this, is, you know, how do we stay connected? And ironically, I think in a work of remote work or life of work, working remotely, our need of human interaction is the main thing. Um, if you look at what Gallup writes about their research about the state of work globally, they also look at this and they say actually the, the new measure of success is actually employee engagement and thriving well-being. And that's personal part, the, the thriving well-being, how people are doing in a personal space at a personal level, actually is something that be, now becomes part of the world of work that organizations will need to attend to as another aspect to say, how do we help employees to be healthy? Last part, I think, one immediate thing that companies can look to and should look to is, is to really empower leaders or managers because leaders and managers have got impact. They can scale impact in organizations. So helping managers and training managers and supporting managers to be healthy and healthy in a wider, very realistic level, mental health, energy, um, being able to manage themselves well, I think is an important first step that many organizations can do is to spend more time helping leaders to be good self-managers. And then that will hopefully impact for the rest of the teams who they can lead in saying, this is how we create certainty um, in our teams and our organizations. And look for small sort of opportunities for empathy. Um, you know, online empathy looks like, am I here? Are you hearing me? Am I on? <laughs> That's sort of the empathy online. Um, spending time in the future physically with each other is at a premium and i think companies will do well to understand that when we are together we need to think differently about the value of physical presence and what happens between people when we are allowed to be with each other thanks andre thank you because uh yeah online empathy that's a interesting topic to think about so I want to close with, with a few uh, questions uh, to the panel members. Uh, McEllery, I thought uh, I'll ask you, uh, th there's a question around just employees in the, in the tech space uh, at the moment. I think it's people with opportunities. Just what you've experienced over the last 18 months uh, in terms of your, your employees' experience uh, in, in, the, in the tech space with a different way of working. Just in a minute or so. Uh, yeah, I think everyone 
enjoyed the 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 the, the freedom of, of of being working remote and also time that said we've always had that freedom so but i guess it you, you have somewhat more even that space and and the good news was and on the positive side everyone was willing to try it out i mean we're a bunch of tech people so if you if you can use these things you want to try it out and there are many tech companies that actually are completely remote which is not even following the hybrid world. So, so, so that makes makes the, the willingness, uh, e- makes it easier to do that. On the negative side, if you can call it that way, uh, especially at the beginning of the lockdown, there were people for a very long time completely alone since we have a much younger workforce and, and that was certainly challenging and people got out of touch. So technically you stay alone, but those interactions, those things, they were all just going away. And, and, and so meetings towards the end also become longer, so it's difficult to align. Um, and then really at the, at the very end, I can say that now people actually appreciate interactions just so much more. If you read it together in a room, especially nowadays, when we're in this third wave, again, you can't be a full room of people, so you have to be careful again. And then we, we just appreciate what's going on. I, I mean, I'm a stop. But I can just say that a couple of weeks ago, we, we, there was an invite that, do we want to go and have lunch together? And before we know, everyone in the, that was at the office at that point was going out and actually having a lunch and just, just telling us how people appreciate this, this real interaction. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think there is sometimes there's simple solutions. We just have to, have to do it. Uh, because you talked about... Uh, Office rhythms that's disrupted. I wonder if there's uh, specific rhythms that you've seen that help. Maybe an example or two new rhythms. I think two things that I've that I've seen is quite valuable to employees. Is one I've seen how some MDs or managers um, have have implemented sort of in person meetings with the employees individually. So there's a stronger focus on sort of that check-in to say, how are you really doing? Yeah. I think this is obviously created a higher sense of connection, but also access to supervisors, managers, leaders. Um, so I think that's valuable. I've definitely seen an, an overall increase from with most of my clients in terms of structured team sessions, where there's a very intentional physical get-together to say, let's talk about what we need as a team. And I think what a big part of that is about asking the teams, how do you want to be together? Mm. And what are the topics that are sort of top of mind for you that's important for you? And, and we prepare meetings or sessions around that short session, sort of on a weekly basis, monthly basis, two hours. But it comes from employees. And I think that's where there's a different or a new type of connection that happens that's quite intentional. Yeah, I think that's something we can be very innovative and creative about. And again, it's it's some 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 of that is quite simple, but just to create those rhythms. Uh, Renel, you talked about uh, the way that people's expectations change. I think that's something that I've also experienced. We just expect now. Um, maybe you can you can just elaborate about your your experience there. You know, how is the expectations different than fifteen months ago? Yes, uh, thank you, Andre. Yes, I, I have an interesting, uh, in, during the first sort of odd lockdown, uh, we had a parent emailing us to say, um, uh, in these uncertain times, surely we are entitled to some answers. So there's a petition <laughs> that, um, that somehow the organization will not experience the same uncertainties as the stakeholders and that you must come up with quick answers to many of the questions and the uncertainties and and with the rapid changes, and it happens all the time. It's not a one change, and then we said you, you, we all, we've all experienced this. Um, so, so um, there's definitely, uh, and it links to I think what McKellery also has mentioned. There's a need for much more frequent communication, and to be very transparent, and to say that you don't have the answers if you don't have them yet, and to communicate the timeline. So to say we know that you are worried about this. Um, we are grappling with this now. We hope to have an answer by then. Um, and to also articulate the, um, the impediments or the, the challenges to say we are waiting for um, an announcement by the Minister of Higher Education. We cannot make a decision before we don't know what the sectoral approach would be. So to mm. also 
articulate the, the aspects that are holding you back. So, so from my perspective, definitely, um, the more uncertainty in the space, I think the more there's a need for, for quick and uh, answers and for certainty, um, and the perception that this big institution, surely you, you're in the know and you have the answers, but yes, communication, transparency, and, and frequent, much more frequent communication than you would normally have. Thanks, Andre. Yeah, thank you, Renel. I think McEllery also mentioned that you know, in his first talk, uh, you know, how we need to be more definite about that. Peter, I'm going to end with you. Um, and uh, I sort of started with trust and, you know, how do we build, uh, you know, systems with more trust. I was just wondering in the leadership space, maybe um, one or two examples of how you intentionally uh, build trust in your leadership team. Yeah, Andre, um, at, um, uh, when we went into lockdown, um, the, there was obviously a lot of uncertainty. And um, what we started doing very quickly was to create the, uh, town, town hall meetings. We call them imbizos, where we get everyone together and um, started communicating in a lot more detail than we've ever done before where the organization is. And um, we found that that was really appreciated and, and helpful. And um, uh, the second thing we, uh, we found that was, um, was that as we came back, we actually said we really need to look at our culture to clearly communicate and articulate and align around what our culture is. Um, because if we're working more remote, we need to know that we see things in a similar way, that at least the things that are really important to the organization. And the third thing that we've um, challenged each other on um, was the necessity to give proactive feedback, affirmative, affirming feedback or challenging feedback. We, we did a culture survey recently and uh, we actually came out lowest in terms of the, the people's experience of feedback. People want feedback because there's this gap all of a sudden where you're in between spaces you're not there where you were all the time um, in the past and it creates room for uncertainty am i doing a good enough job should i do better am i expected to do more and so feedback and regular feedback is just really important thank you so much peter that's that's quite practical we're gonna we're gonna wrap with this thanks so much for for, for joining today i hope it was fruitful for you uh, you're welcome to, to uh, give any feedback and uh, we will definitely be in touch and have a great Tuesday.